Last week, an article came out in the National Post called Canada's Adventure Gap, Why It Doesn't Make Sense for the Great Outdoors to Be Such a White Space. The article is highlighting research done by a PhD student, Jacqueline Scott, at the University of Toronto's Ontario Institute for Studies in Education. And I will preface this by saying that the Ontario Institute for Studies in Education, also known as OISE, is a poisonous institution. And Jacqueline Scott is in the PhD program of social justice education, which is a poisonous program. There is a sense that the outdoors is a white space, that people of color don't belong in that space, Scott said in an interview. People of color want to do it, but they need a bridge to get them there. So for a lot of people, this may immediately come off as a completely asinine statement. Um, the outdoors does not discriminate against skin color. I have never heard anybody imply anything close to the idea that people of color do not belong in the outdoors. And I think that while bridging programs could be great in some cases, like making a skiing lesson program for immigrant children or something, I do wonder, at what point does it become condescending to suggest that some people need bridging programs to get them to do things, uh, as if they could not take the initiative themselves. In my childhood, my dad always took me hiking, camping, skiing, kayaking, boating, etc. So these values and interests were instilled in me from very early on. Now, I think if your parents or family immigrated from somewhere uh, that didn't have skiing or hiking trails or river rafting, then it is indeed more than likely that you won't grow up doing those activities. Um, but in Canada, school field trips foster a connection with the environment. Uh, I grew up outside of Vancouver, British Columbia, so my school field trips involved snowshoeing, skiing, going to nature reserves, kayaking, um, and in places in Canada where there aren't mountains or oceans, they usually still snowshoe or cross-country ski or go for nature walks. The article reads, As the only black woman in her many outdoor clubs, sometimes the only person of color, she said she has come to realize that the barrier is not mainly economic or logistic, but somehow cultural. Now, we know that the left has largely abandoned class in favor of identity issues. To me, the biggest barrier for participation in any outdoor activity is time and money. If you have two jobs and you, because you don't have a lot of money, let's say you work full-time Monday to Friday and then you have a part-time job on the weekends, um, you're not going to be able to do a weekend camping getaway. And then you need to have a car uh, to be able to access a lot of the trails and national parks. And if you want to own your own snowboard or mountain bike or whatever, that's going to get really expensive. Um, but, you know, when I lived near Vancouver, I could take the public transit bus to Grouse Mountain, for example, to hike or snowshoe or ski. Um, a lot of the best and most beautiful hiking trails are accessible by bus. But now I live in Ontario uh, and I don't have a car, so I don't really spend a lot of time outdoors. So in my case, though I'm not a person of color, you know, you can apply the example of an economic and logistic barrier to the reason why I'm not participating in outdoor activities right now. You know, overall, I'm quite skeptical of this claim that people of color don't participate in outdoor adventures uh, because of cultural reasons above all else. I would say it's economic and, and perhaps a combination of the economic and the cultural. So, you know, let's not forget how much material wealth actually really matters in these situations because sometimes in discussions of identity, this gets lost. Originally, my intention was to make this video solely about the One National Post article, but I realized the outdoor diversity, equity, and inclusion movement is bigger than I thought. And there are quite a few news articles about the topic, but more interesting are the community movements that have an online presence. One of these is Unlikely Hikers, which seems to me like an assortment of social justice warriors who share the common interest of hiking. Um, the website has the usual stuff about gender pronouns and uh, indigenous land acknowledgements, but it also encourages outdoors people to stop using colonialist language like crushing miles and conquering peaks. And that for me goes way too far. Um, that for me is an embarrassingly silly. To say. From there, I somehow ended up on a GoFundMe site for something called Wild Diversity. Uh, the woman behind the GoFundMe writes, It is not clear that there is a welcoming space for people of color in wild spaces. It isn't clear that there are safe, comfortable spaces for queer people in the outdoors. Well, 
I mean, the outdoors is not really safe or comfortable for anyone. That's kind of the point. Uh, it isn't clear that people can hike their own hike or enjoy the forest in the way that feels the best for them. Meaningless. The forest is more than a place for summit preparation. It is a place to also relax, rest, and rejuvenate in the purest parts of our world. The forest is a place to grow, heal, and feel nurtured. The forest is a place to escape inward by going outside. Well, it seems to me that um, people like this are not really escaping the inward because they're so focused on their non-binary queer fat identities that they cannot explore the outdoors unless they center their identity. Uh, in fact, their identity must mediate their entire outdoor experience. Next, I went to a site called Diversify Outdoors, a coalition of social media influencers who share the goal of promoting diversity in outdoor spaces where people of color, LGBTQIA, and other diverse identities have historically been underrepresented. What I notice on this site, and this is a common theme in the outdoor diversity scene, is an emphasis on representation in ad campaigns. Um, the National Post article mentioned this too. Jacqueline Scott said that the adventure gap is largely about representations in marketing and advertising, and she used this notion of um, visual apartheid, and she states, you take a look at any outdoor advertising, you don't see us. Look in the outdoor catalog, you don't see us. Likewise, the Diversify Outdoors site states, people of color and other diverse identities have long been underrepresented in the outdoors industry and its advertising campaigns, despite our undeniable purchasing power. And in their allyship guide, one of their bullet points is, write your favorite outdoor brands and ask them to diversify their marketing and brand ambassadors to include more people of color, LGBTQIA, body positivity, and other diverse communities. Okay, so rather than writing your local politician about a political or social or economic issue, write to a corporation and ask for their models to look more diverse. To be fair, I absolutely believe that advertisements should have diverse models. Uh, I think it should be a given. It seems to me, though, that the politics of representation are starting to go too far. It seems quite ludicrous to think that I could not feel comfortable participating in a certain outdoor activity unless I see myself, someone exactly like me, uh, represented in the corporate marketing materials of an outdoor brand. And I think it's unfortunate that rather than petitioning brands to perhaps start using organic cotton instead of regular cotton, or stop using sweatshops in Cambodia and Bangladesh, we are petitioning them to have more non-binary fat models with uh, septum piercings. So I think brands should just simply have a diversity of models so we can all move on to bigger issues. But you know, for what it's worth, I decided to go to the websites of the first four Canadian outdoor brands I could think of um, just to see if people of color were underrepresented. And for the most part, it wasn't really true. Lululemon, diversity. MEC or Mountain Equipment Co-op, diversity. Cabela's, diversity. Canada Goose, diversity. And again, these are Canadian brands, so maybe the situation in the States or elsewhere is different, but it seems to me from spending a couple minutes on these four websites that the claim of underrepresentation of people of color is rather unfounded, and if there is a problem, it does seem to be getting better. So next, I ended up on a blog post on Nature Canada about inclusivity in outdoor education programs, and of course, it is a reflection. One of the major points of the article is that when facilitating an outdoor education program, one should avoid hiring a traditionally masculine male. But wouldn't you think that the majority of people who are competent in the outdoors are traditionally masculine males? Um, because they are probably less scared of the myriad dangers and threats that the outdoors does present. Uh, then the article says, One of the most recent social media world communities I am loving is Unlikely Hikers started by Jenny Brusso. So I already brought this one up. This is the woman who says that um, we should not use colonialist language like conquering mountains. It is a virtual community that highlights people of color and people from the LGBTQ plus community we love hiking. It's not that surprising. Hiking is pretty great. Your queer student body would also appreciate knowing other queer people who do this activity. I guess when I hear this sentence, I think to myself, why wouldn't queer people be doing this activity? 
uh, why wouldn't they be hiking? Like, why would I assume that this is something they would not be participating in? My default is assuming that queer people are people. So some enjoy the outdoors and some don't. But you know, if you're queer and you feel like you have a different experience outdoors than a heterosexual person does, you should comment below because I am interested. At the end of the day, I just think it's great when people are out in nature and getting exercise. So I've tried to offer a really balanced approach to these outdoor diversity and inclusion collectives instead of just bashing them. I just wonder how helpful these movements really are. I've tried in this video to understand and assess their claims as best I can, um, but you know, I am asking people of color, people with disabilities, queer people, etc. Um, respond if you can and, and add your voice to this. Do you feel like the mountains and oceans and forests of Canada and the US uh, are heterosexual white spaces? Or is that totally ludicrous to you? And you know, on, on behalf of a typical white outdoorsy Canadian, I'll just say again that I'm happy anyone is enjoying the outdoors. And you can guarantee that when I'm outside, I am probably not focusing on your gender identity and your body weight because I'm enjoying myself and I'm, I'm looking at my surroundings. I took a class um, about two years ago. It was a class on human origins, so there was a lot about primates. And we watched this video where there was a chimpanzee sitting beside a waterfall and just watching the waterfall. And the narrator was explaining that it's very likely that chimpanzees have this sense of something bigger than themselves and they kind of understand natural phenomena and this chimp was just watching the waterfall in awe. And so what I wonder is whether an overemphasis on race, gender, and sexuality actually serves to be more divisive than unifying. Um, and rather than seeing ourselves as people, humans, just like chimpanzees who find the outdoors wonderful and sublime, uh, we compartmentalize. So that, you know, only trans people can hike together because they experience hiking differently. And only non-white people can hike together because they experience hiking differently. Maybe at the end of the day, uh, it just comes down to people wanting to hike with other people like them. Asians want to hike with other Asians. Uh, fat people want to hike with other fat people. And that's fine. Nothing wrong with wanting to be around people who have similar experiences and interests as you do. Um, but, you know, is this a matter of self-segregation? Even Scott addresses this. As far as I'm aware, there, she's talking about Asians, the only people of color group that I've seen regularly outside in the parks, but they are doing it within their own ethnic group. So I think when university research is being conducted on this stuff and foundations are being set up to address it and news articles are written about it, we should really be able to question, who is this helping? And does this perspective actually reflect the perspective of the majority? So if one Latino person in the U.S. says that they feel uncomfortable in national parks because the uniforms look like border police uniforms, you know, do the majority of Latino people feel this way? Or is that a view that's just really out there and doesn't really apply to anybody else? On how do we get uh, uh, Latinos, for example, to start using the national parks? And I suggested to them that, uh, first of all, the uniforms that they wear uh, really resemble the uh, immigration. They, and, uh, in fact, they said that the immigration copied them. Uh, so already that's a little concerning going up concerning uh, or disconcerting going up to a station. You have people that actually look like Border Patrol. Not that all uh, Latinos are, are uh, undocumented. I mean, the vast majority of us were born in the United States. But nevertheless, it reminds us uh, of that.